Good evening, and welcome to CITI Media Reporter. I'm Howard Hominoff, and thank you for joining us. This is our first on-location uh, shot here for uh, Media Reporter, and we're very happy to have Sri Srinivasan, who is the Chief Digital Officer at the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York. Sri, thank you so much for joining us. Delighted to be here, and thank you for coming out to the Metropolitan Museum. Well, uh, it's terrific. Um, and, you know, we're in New York, and sometimes as a, as a New Yorker, you know, you get uh, your, you, uh, this is the center of the universe, you know, perspective. But really, the Met for New Yorkers and for, for people all over the world is, is such a special place. Talk about why, why is the Met, in a world of so many museums and so many things going on in New York, why is the Met sort of seem so important? Well, I just saw something that was really scary. It said, uh, the, a fact that said that, uh, there are more museums in America than there are Starbucks. So that, if you, that sounds scary, that, right? You may have just <laughs> made news, yeah, actually. Exactly. I don't know if people would realize that. <laughs> I couldn't believe it because there's a Starbucks everywhere you turn in New York. Right. Uh, so people always ask me what's yep. special about the Met and when, in fact, there are yep. as many. Even if they're not as many as Starbucks, there are certainly so many. Um, uh, muse uh, you know, so many museums. Uh, there are several things that make us uh, st uh, special. Uh, the first is that we are the world's largest encyclopedic museum, which means that it's the only museum that is this large that also covers the entire scope of human creativity, 5,000 years of human creativity from every culture in the world. So there are obviously fantastic museums like the Louvre, which is beautiful but doesn't have Asian art. Or you look at the British Museum, which is, again, wonderful, but doesn't have contemporary art. So like that, you can find every museum has something that might be missing. And we have every part of human history represented here, human creativity represented here. We are also New York's largest tourist attraction. And that's a very competitive landscape. So everything from the uh, Empire State Building, the Statue of Liberty, to the new things like the High Line. You know, this is where a city that has so many great things also gets the High Line. And uh, I encourage everybody to go and, and check that out. But the Met continues to have a wonderful in-person pre in presence. Uh, tourists from around the world come here. We have 6.2 million people who come to the uh, Met every year. And we have about 40 million people who uh, are touched by the Met online. And our goal is to make the Met connect the kind of the physical and the digital, the in-person and the online. A couple of other things to keep in mind, the Met has about 2 million square feet of space, making it the largest museum building in the world. The Louvre, again, has much bigger grounds, but the Met has about 100,000 square feet more uh, than the Louvre. Uh, it are, also, are they engaged in a building competition <laughs> yeah, to, try, to try to beat you out or anything? No, okay. we don't. No, the, right. the, the Louvre <laughs> is, is so wonderful that uh, we're, yeah. we're not in competition. In fact, this is one of the funny things that happened. I was uh, speaking at a conference, and the spon you know how they have the speaker uh, lineups on a brochure? And my son was looking over my shoulder, and he saw a picture of me and Glenn Lowry, who is the head of the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA another wonderful museum here in New York. And he said, hey, isn't that your biggest enemy? And you know, he's an 11-year-old kid. He didn't know any better. And I said, no, no, no. We're, we're all in this together. And uh, we might be frenemies. We might be in co cooperation, But we're not, uh, we're not enemies. And uh, recently, I got to see Glenn uh, separately. And I took a photo together. And we posted it on Twitter and saying, see, we're not enemies. And uh, uh, that's one of the wonderful um, parts of the museum world is that everybody knows that we have to work together. And there's so many interesting things happening in museums. And what has happened for me in this last year or so that I've been at this job is trying to get people to understand all the great stuff that goes on at museums. Even if not, it's not at the Met, just everywhere. Every important museum in the world has so much cool stuff going on. So well, it leads me to. You know, when I describe who's coming on as a, as a guest on the, the program, et cetera, um, you know, some, often the reaction to you is, now that must be, that is about the coolest <laughs> job title in the world, the chief digital <laughs> officer of the Metropolitan Museum. What, what is, talk a little bit about what your, you know, what your, your particular mission is here and sort of how you spend your time and what the digital um, media focus of the museum is. 
Well, thank you. That's very kind. Uh, as you know, any job that you, that other people think is cool often has <laughs> aspects that are not as cool. But uh, I've yet to find uh, that part of my job. Uh, my job, uh, really, as I look at it, is to uh, help the the Met in uh, everything it does that's forward facing, that's public uh, facing. And uh, there is a CTO and a CDO. The CTO, the Chief Technology Officer of the Met. Jeff Spar is a fantastic colleague. We work together. We're kind of in meetings every week, multiple times a week. And what we do is uh, he takes care of the infrastructure, the networking, the computers, the devices, uh, the security, uh, all of that for our uh, technology. And then I look at the forward-facing part, the audience-facing part. So everything from uh, email to web, uh, so email the content part, he runs the systems, but we look at the content, we send out millions of email messages uh, a year, um, we have a social media team that we double to two people, we have uh, a, a, a video team that uh, produces uh, 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 very sophisticated uh, documentaries, but we also do two minute little clips, uh, we shoot things with iPhone to multiple camera uh, shoots. Uh, we have a team that does uh, the kind of the traditional uh, uh, technology and museums audio guides, and we can talk about that if you like. It's a, it's a it's big, it's still a big business. Uh, we um, also look at the collect what's called the collections information, uh, which um, uh, takes care of the the materials information about the material we've collected. Uh, we have um, a web team that does the website and, and so on. There are 70 people in the digital media department at the Met. And when I mention that, most people cannot believe it because uh, it just sounds like, what are all these people doing? And what is the ROI on all the social media? So I do get those questions. But at the heart of it, I like to say I'm trying to tell a million plus stories about our million plus objects to a billion plus people. And it was a bad idea when I articulated this because now you're suddenly putting, uh, you know, numbers on something that is so immeasurable in a way. So now the problem is my boss can look every year and say, "Hey, wait a minute! You said a billion people, and you're at 40 million. So that's a long way to go." So what are some of the, you know, from a from a? It may not be a profit-making institution, but it's an institution, and you mentioned you mentioned numbers. So what are the kinds of metrics? that you and the museum look at to get a sense of how well you're doing um, and, and where, you're, where you're getting better or where you may need to do things differently. This is something that I, I think about every day. How do we justify the, uh, our presence here and how can we help with the mission of the museum? And so it all starts with the mission of, and the vision of our director, Thomas Campbell, and uh, helping him uh, do what he wants to do. And uh, we are, uh, we have been now, uh, uh, we're almost 150 years old. In 2020, we'll celebrate our 150th. And uh, we, we've been two locations for most of that time. The Met on Fifth Avenue and uh, 82nd Street, and uh, a, a um, medieval garden and uh, set of buildings called the Cloisters in Upper Manhattan. And not enough uh, uh, people around the world come to that, and we want people to go there as well. And it's a it's a wonderful, uh, very uh, I'll important. I'll back you on the, yeah, yeah, the cloisters. Yeah, that, it, it's you. a phenomenal space that I agree. People because it isn't right in Midtown. Exactly. Maybe people don't see it exactly you know, near as much. But, exactly, but they yeah. they need to go there. And um, what we uh, and then the Whitney Museum, which is a, another landmark museum in New York, is uh, moving from its location on 75th Street and Madison Avenue, not too far from where we are today and is moving down to that High Line right, space. Right. And so we're taking over that building. So now we're going to have three locations, all within a few miles of each other. And we want to give each of them uh, equal importance. But we also want to say there's a fourth location. And the fourth location is the digital space. And so we're going to have these three physical locations, one digital space. And we want people to come to the museum. But we are also OK if you only interact with us most of the time online, but maybe you'll put us on your bucket list. Maybe you'll come once in your life. Maybe you'll uh, send your, 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 your kid, you tell your children you've got to go visit. And that's what we think we can do because everybody in the world has a piece of their 
culture here at the Met. Now, when people come to the Met, they have different reactions. Some people come and say, gee, uh, why is this not back home? Uh, in some cases, yeah, they see yeah. it. And then, uh, some, then the other day, a group of Syrian journalists came to visit uh, me, and they said, where's our Syrian, do you, have a, you said you have everything, do you have Syrian collection? And I said, we do. And I thought, oh my God, they might say, <laughs> you know, why is it not back in Syria? Instead, they went to look at it, and it's in our Islamic wing, absolutely uh, impeccable blue um, uh, pieces of, uh, 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 um, like, I was going to say a piece of china, but, you know, they're, they're like right, uh, right. Uh, pots and pottery and, 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 uh, and glazed uh, materials. And uh, they said, they, they looked at it for a few minutes, and they turned to me and said, thank God this is here, because if it had been back in Syria, it would all have been destroyed. Yeah. And that's one of the things we're doing here is, 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 is keeping the legacy of the world in, in this place. Now, we're not saying we're doing it better than anybody else. Lots of places do that. But we also say we're doing this in the public interest. Uh, so, for example, we, you look at these uh, public auctions or, or you, you see these art auctions uh, from, uh, that happen from time to time, and recently there was another one, and prices of these paintings, you know, you'll see an artist uh, selling for $100 million, and it'll go into uh, a private collection never to be seen again until it's then on the gavel 20 years from now. Uh, but when you come to the Met, you can see all of those kinds of artists here every day on display. And that's one of the things that we want to get, uh, make, make people excited about that. So what's, um, what's really hard about your job, or what are the biggest obstacles to try to move the ball forward? I think the biggest obstacle is that there's too much exciting stuff going on here. I'll give you an example. Uh, we have 45 special exhibitions a year. Most museums will have between 3 and 5 or 3 and 10. And that means there's too much to call attention to. If I want to tell stories about things, then you have to have room to tell those stories. Uh, so the, the special exhibitions are, 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 are not, I mean, they're not a problem. It's wonderful that you have all this. But how do you get attention to all of those things? Uh, I uh, will walk with my friends through our arms and armor galleries. Uh, our arms and armor department would be one of the largest arms museums in the world if it weren't inside the Met, then, then you know, it, it would just not, you know, our musical instruments, the same thing like that. We can go on with how many of these departments. And when you walk by, you won't even notice that we have a pair of handmade spurs by Paul Revere. And you just walk by them. You don't, you know, and so I stop right. and I, I look, and no one who's ever walked with me has noticed them because there's so much other yeah. great yeah. stuff. And, you know, it's right near, uh, right next, I mean, right near that is, the uh, armor that Henry VIII wore. And you can tell he's you know, a little, little on the heavy side. But next to it is an armor that he wore a few years earlier when he was a skinnier guy because he had problems with his, uh, um, with his health and that's how he put on all that weight. But all of that you wouldn't notice. You'll be so struck by the traditional Henry VIII vision or, or you know, uh, uh, image so that you'll look at that and you won't even notice this is other armor. So how do we tell those stories? How do we, um, you know, in another museum, those handmade spurs by Paul Revere would be on a pedestal yeah. Yeah. and would be highlighted. And we just don't have the bandwidth because there's so much great stuff. Another example, we have the largest Van Gogh collection this side of the Atlantic. And that's 17 paintings. And all 17 are together for the first time in a dozen years. And if you walk up to the building, there's no sign of that. If you walk uh, into the you know into the main info desk and ask them what to see. They're going to show you 45 other wonderful things. They don't. They're not going to even think of this because this is in our permanent collection, and 16 are together and one is in another gallery. And if you happen to just walk by that gallery and you see, you say, oh, it's cute. The Met has one Van Gogh. There's no sign that says 16 <laughs> brothers upstairs. Go see them. And that's sort of what, um, so when we're in the, in the Van Gogh galleries, I will watch people. And, you know, there's this thing we call the Museum Mosey, where they're kind of just walking, and they've got kind of glazed eyes, and some things they get their attention. So I'll, I'll pull somebody aside and say, look, 17 Van Goghs all together. It's so exciting. And they'll say, oh, my God. And then they'll start taking selfies right. and just going crazy. One guy called his mother in front of me saying, Mom, you've got to come see this. Now, 
we can't do this for everybody, right? Yeah. Six million people, we yeah. can't have Tom Campbell or me or anyone else stand there and say, look at this. But in another, in another museum, there would have been a sign outside, say, yeah. 17, muse you know, 17 Van Goghs, come inside. That's the, the biggest challenge. But what a fun challenge to have. Uh, other museums that have a single masterpiece of um, disproportionate fame, the Mona Lisa at the Louvre, Starry Night at MoMA, uh, things like that, they have an advantage because you just have to show that one thing and people will come. Uh, we don't have that one thing. We have many things, but none, no single thing is as famous as everything uh, as those two, though Washington crossing the Delaware is pretty close. Uh, but how do we do that? So I think it's, a, it's an opportunity as well as a challenge, and uh, we're up for that challenge. So uh, I'm going to introduce a new segment to the program this evening, which is show and tell. <laughs> so uh, anybody who has uh, been watching may have noticed uh, this uh, interesting uh, sculpture here in front of us. So tell me what this is and why it's, it has a particularly interesting story. So this is, uh, you, if, uh, I don't know how it looks on screen because it may not be as, um, uh, as clear, but this is basically a 3D printed version of one of our uh, works of art. And uh, what I like about it is it, it's a way for us to kind of um, talk about uh, the world of art in a, in a new way. And I'm just going to look at our, uh, we have an app that we developed, and maybe we should talk about you know, the world of yeah, mobile, but, yeah, but yeah. this is still interesting. So yeah. this is uh, printed in, uh, as part of our uh, media lab, where we're trying to uh, think about the future of connecting with audiences and things like that. And so this is Marcia. So I'm just reading from this. You know, I'm not an art person, so I'm learning every I day. I thought you just knew all of this <laughs> yeah, stuff yeah, off exactly. the top of your head. But exactly. Okay. <laughs> so Marcia is by Balthazar Permoser, and I'm sure I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing a bad job on pronouncing it. Uh, by the Someone way, what, in this museum might be very upset with oh, no, that. Exa yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, what I tell people when I take them on a tour is this is the amateur tour. We have 200 <laughs> professional tours a month, uh, a week. I mean, so come see them. Don't, don't, don't uh, listen to me. But um, this is a sculpture of, a, of Marcius, a satyr, a half man, half goat, shows his face contorted with agony, as you can see. In the Greek myth, the god Apollo flays him alive for daring to challenge him in a musical contest. And that's what you look like when you're being flayed alive. No one should ever have it's that not experience. A good day. No, no, not a good day. <laughs> in fact, the folks at BuzzFeed came by and we gave them a tour and they did a piece 23 statues having a worse Monday than you. And you know, so and, they were able to capture. And how was the how was the buzz <laughs> on that? On that, uh, did you see? You know, what kind of a reaction did that? Get? Well, people love that kind yeah. of thing, right? Yeah. You know, uh, our our challenge is that we want people uh, to understand and appreciate the art, and uh, to use our authority and credibility without dumbing it down, uh, but at the same time be more accessible. And I think universities have done a great job of that, and museums. Uh, can have a long way to go in making that possible. Uh, but anyway, the other part of this is, uh, this is kind of interesting technology. We, we are doing this to see how these get better and look better. And in the year that I've been here, the quality of uh, this kind of production has become faster, cheaper, and more uh, realistic. And uh, there are lots of applications. You can imagine that a blind person uh, who is not able to see uh, our statue, we can hand this to them and they can feel it. Though it also turns out a lot of sighted people want to grab it and kind of touch it because yeah. you want to touch. Or, or, yeah. And that's one of the things that we don't do here. But by the way, just for blind people, we have a touch tour for not just this, I mean actual mm -hmm. objects yeah. that they're allowed to touch. Uh, so we're, we're looking to um, make all of this more accessible. I, I mentioned our app. Uh, one of the things that we did is um, pull together this app, and we want it to be a little different from traditional museum apps. Most apps try to uh, uh, be a museum in your pocket where they put everything right. inside. Instead, we want you to use it for three minutes and put it away, or two minutes and put it away. And we built it on three principles. It should be simple, useful, and delightful. And uh, we're not trying to be everything in, in, in this one app. I, I, one of the models I use for this kind of technology is the Dark Sky app, which I recommend to everyone. Uh, it is, in a world of thousands of apps, what it does, thousands of weather apps, what it does is it tells you if it's going to rain where you're standing in the next hour. So that kind of practical, simple 
applications uh, is useful. So, uh, but people ask me, what's the hardest thing I've done this year? It wasn't making the app, it wasn't uh, any of the other projects, but uh, getting the Met's permission to put these buttons that we have on George Washington's face. Uh, and this is where uh, I, I tell people, this is the kind of approach that they're willing to try new things and say, this is important. More people have the app, more they're going to uh, get out of the museum. Do you, do you worry that, you know, in the, in the television, bi traditional media business, there's the worry that, you know, new media opportunities are going to cannibalize kind of their existing business. Do you worry that an easier accessibility to some of what is at the museum, whether it's watching videos or even just seeing wonderful pictures of what's going on here, that that somehow will lead to people not not sort of feeling the need to come and be here, but geez, I can you know I can sure. appreciate on my app or my sure. you know my phone, etc. Uh, this is the kind of a central question in terms of uh, major industries. The education business is the same way, right? Uh, in the world of MOOCs, where everybody's got these massive open courses that anybody can take anything, why would anyone go to the university? Well, there's magic that happens when a professor, a skilled professor with 10 students around a table, there's nothing better than that. Similarly, uh, there's nothing better than you and a piece of art in a gallery. Uh, but there are ways in which we can enhance the information, give you a better experience, by supplementing it with technology. And we believe, there was a worry in the early days of museums in the web uh, that if you put everything online, people won't come. Yeah. I believe that you make a virtuous circle. You make the online experience so wonderful that people say, oh my God, I gotta go see it in person. And then once they come here, they love what they see, that they wanna stay in touch when they leave. And either through social or the app, or um, any of the other ways, they want to stay in touch. So that's that case you have to make. And it isn't obvious, uh, but we, we have to make that case. And um, so far, we have a very um, supportive board and a supportive uh, leadership team. And that's what you really need. So you mentioned Dark Sky. Mm -hmm. And it, it reminds me that you know the, the part, one of the great things of having you here is not 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 only uh, your work at the Met, but sort of your uh, observational perspective on the media business. Mm -hmm. Give us a sense of what what are some other things going on now, whether it's apps or mm -hmm. content or platforms that you're particularly excited about. They may or may not be things that are affecting your day to day sure. job, but that sure. that you kind of are excited about in the digital media world. I, I taught for uh, four years uh, an entrepreneurship class with Ken Lehrer, Kenneth Lehrer, who uh, was the co-founder of the Huffington Post. And uh, he said so many things in those four years that resonate with me every day as I think about not just my work at the Met, but the media landscape today. And among the things he talked about is that the most important things that will shape the media landscape, and this is now four or five years ago, he was saying is it's uh, social, mobile, local, and video. Social, mobile, local, and video. And if you take each of those things, he's been absolutely right. So social media is the way in which you get the word out about what you're doing. You engage people in the conversation. Uh, you talk about um, mobile. Uh, there is we know we have people with titles like senior mobile producer, but we don't have senior desktop producer. That'll all morph into one thing. One of our things we want to do with our website is to make it responsive. And how you tell a website is responsive is when you pull out your phone, do you have to pinch and zoom? If you pinch and zoom, it is not a responsive website. Every website in the world has to be responsive mm -hmm. in the short future, short term. And so we're working on a big project to do that. Uh, we know we have hundreds of thousands of pages, so it's it's not that easy. Uh, so uh, mobile, uh, Eric Schmidt uh, of Google was uh, here a few years ago, um, five years ago, talking to our boss, Tom Campbell, uh, about the future. And he said, he pulled out uh, and said, this phone is going to be the most important part of your museum. And he and my boss now talks about this, that he couldn't understand why a phone, which is an elitist thing, would be what uh, would drive the future of the museum. When in fact, now, as, as Tom uh, has demonstrated in his daily support and his 
a very active participation in Instagram, and we can talk about that. He's by the way, Thomas P. Campbell on Instagram. Uh, is that you know something like 90% of our uh, of our visitors have a phone? Not all have smartphones, but you know that's that's where it's going. Where we've seen 40% of YouTube views are now on mobile. So even this idea of the mobile as a second screen. Right is going to likely be flipped to the, the other way. So, so social and mobile, uh, I having ha had the um, uh, opportunity to build this app with my team and, uh, and a company out in Portland called Instrument uh, on, on the app, I have learned so much more about mobile since then. Um, the, another thing you can think of is video. And we've talked about, you know, it's, and Howard, you and I know that we've been talking about video is going to be the, the big thing online for a long time. And it just hasn't been the case, but now we're there. And then finally, local. Uh, people want to know not just what you're doing, but where you're doing it, what you're, who you're with. And that kind of geolocation, I think, is going to be very big, and we should all be paying attention. Three in addition to the kind of evangelical role that, that you have to have in, in educating the world about what you do, you've also got to educate yourself mm -hmm. and, and stay abreast of an incredibly fast-changing digital media world. And for students and others in the academic world I know are part of our audience, what is it that you look to to educate yourself on a day-to-day -day basis about keeping abreast of the latest developments? Well, start by being on your mailing list. So that's a good way to uh, learn what's going on. So I recommend everybody do that. Uh, uh, but also reading a lot. And in a, war in a time when we don't have a lot of uh, you know, space in your life for, for, for the stuff, that's why being on Twitter is a good way to uh, figure out the things that are important that you want to uh, whenever, that you want to listen to. If anyone ever says to me Twitter is useless or is a waste of time, I say you're not listening to the right people. So um, I also tell people you should be reading things like Mashable. Uh, I read it three times a day. Maybe you read it twice a week. But you have to right. find some yep. kind of uh, way to get new ideas. But also um, tell your friends to point out good new things that, they, that you should know about. I also, um, every time I have a lunch meeting or I meet someone new, I say, what's on your phone that I should know? What's an app that you're playing with that I should know about today? And that's how I learn. And we'll never stop learning. And, and uh, what, what do, you, do, you, do you also learn from your kids? Are they, I know you have young children, <laughs> are, they, are they beginning to do things that, that educate you about, about media? Sure, uh, they, they showed me an, an app called the Show Me, uh, which is uh, a wonderful way to uh, teach someone uh, any, anything, because what you can do is you can uh, bring in uh, photography or video, or it's kind of a whiteboard, but a sophisticated whiteboard that then you can share with your team. So I, I've used that. They, they showed it to me. They learned about it in school, and then I've used it with other people. It just works so simply and, and wonderfully. Uh, well, I'd like to thank my guests, Sri Srinivasan, for being here this evening, and thank you for joining us on CITI Media Reporter. I'm Howard Hominoff. Good night.